everyone, welcome to the Make It Big podcast. I'm Leah Spector, Senior Brand Manager at Big Commerce. We have a very special guest today, just before Earth Day. We have best-selling author and founder of the e-commerce master plan podcast series, Chloe Thomas. Chloe is an accomplished e-commerce marketing problem solver on a mission to inspire e-commerce brands to drive a shift in consumer behavior towards sustainable buying habits. Before we get started, as I mentioned before, we're coming up on Earth Day. So let's set the stage a little bit. EarthDay.org, the global organizer for Earth Day, set 2023's theme as invest in our planet. Something tells me we might be able to tie that into e-commerce later in the episode. All kidding aside, this theme gets at how crucial it is to take action now against climate change. According to EarthDay.org, nearly every country in the world is not on track to meet greenhouse gas neutrality by 2050. To get on track, the responsibility falls on governments, citizens, and yes, businesses. This is from the press release that announced this year's theme. Businesses, inventors, investors, and financial markets must drive value for their institutions and society through green innovation and practices. Like other economic revolutions, the private sector has the power to drive the most significant change with both the necessary scale and speed. And with that bold statement, I'd like to welcome Chloe Thomas to the show. Chloe, thank you for being on the Make It Big podcast. Oh, so cool to be here, especially talking about such a big and important topic. So thank you for inviting me on. Absolutely. Well, let's go ahead and get started. It's a big topic. Chloe, let's start in a very broad place and work our way into the weeds of it a bit, uh, because it can't be said enough. Just how important is action against climate change right now? I think it's it should be part of every decision we're making in our lives and in our businesses i don't think i don't think it's re- it's really a good use of energy to argue against climate change happening and looking at what's happening in the climate change space is is quite frankly truly depressing you have to limit how often you look at it it is that bleak at the moment but the positive side of it is there is just so much we can all be doing to um, to deal with climate change, to start the reversal process of climate change and the slowing of climate change, and I think, you know, I've been I've been hanging out in this space for about about coming up on eighteen months now, quite uh, heavily hanging out in this space, and it is a far more positive space than the stats and the outlook um, suggest. There's a huge number of people helping each other out, and year on year, week on week, it's becoming easier to make those changes. So um, so yeah. We, um, it is it's hideously, hideously important that we all start taking action. In the greater scheme of that action we can take against climate change, where does sustainability fit? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I think sustainability is, I mean, my background, I spent 10 years running what was essentially a Google Ads agency. And sustainability is a brilliant keyword, right? Everyone's Googling it, everyone's talking about it. But I think to actually define sustainability is quite hard. So personally, I'm more interested in the path to net zero and the carbon piece, partly because for me, you can calculate it, which is always nice. But I think there is, you know, if we look at kind of sustainability as defined by the UN, as defined by, you know, the team behind COP, et cetera, it, and actually how we're going to save save the human friendly planet, we have to look at sustainability as a wider piece, which is about um looking after the the poorest in society, making for more egalitarian um, communities and a more egalitarian world, uh, looking at empowering women is a big part of it. So there's all these kind of softer pieces we should be doing as well as purely the, how can I reduce the carbon footprint of my business side of things. So how um, important is sustainability? It's kind of like a, a bigger piece above and beyond actually um, save it, that's actually the climate change piece. It's a, it's a bigger standpoint across it all. And what's your personal relationship with sustainability? Like, how do you stay optimistic in the face of such a daunting and dire task? Because you're right, it's a little depressing the more you pay attention to it. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, I... I've always, you know, I remember as a kid getting when the whole kind of uh, greenhouse effect started being talked about. I remember having um, a pretty, a pretty depressive reaction to that. You know, I I'm fascinated by apocalypses in fiction and in the real world, but I find them quite hard to deal with. Um, So 
when you know the reason I pivoted my business to care as much about the sustainability and the carbon side of things as it does about helping people create e-commerce successful e-commerce businesses it was because I went to a virtual conference run by a charity called Population Matters and it was a full day conference I lasted till 11 a.m and then had a few days of deep dark soul searching trying to work out if there was even a place you know if I could even justify staying in the e-commerce industry thankfully got through that and went right let's be a force for good in the industry not a force for bad so I guess what I'm trying to say is I am fully aware of the of the 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 potential depressive impact of this industry and over the last 18 months I've spoken to many people who are deeper in this industry than in this this kind of sector than I am in the sustainability sector who are much closer to the the stats and everything than I am and it's something we all struggle with is you have to expose yourself enough to the negative to keep the momentum going to keep yourself inspired and keep yourself pushing forward you can't purely just hide your head in the sand but you you should spend i think more time in the positive solution part of the space rather than spending too much time reading ipcc reports or other reports that come out because if you if you get if you start wallowing in that your ability your momentum and your ability to make change really grinds to a halt so i think everyone has to work has to find out how much they can risk opening themselves up to the reality um, daily, weekly, monthly, and so forth. It's um, it's a tricky balance to get, but it's worth investing the time in finding it. I love that you decided to stick around and make a positive change in e-commerce because I could absolutely see how you know you would look at kind of the impact of e-commerce as a whole and say, oh, I need to get out of this industry, but I you know we can change it from the inside too. You know, I mentioned at the top of the show, invest in our planet as the theme. Let's talk about investing our planet when it comes to e-commerce, right? How should businesses, whether you're a small business, enterprise business, approach sustainability as part of their business models and really overall ethos? I mean, I think it comes, I, I speak to many businesses um, who are on this journey and I think there's kind of two main approaches people take to it. One is that it's been built into the DNA of their business. So, you know, they are the period pants businesses we hear about, or they are plastic water bottle businesses, you know, reusable plastic water bottle businesses, or they're the amazing businesses who are creating cleaning products, which are more sustainable and so forth. For them, it's often fully in the DNA. Every decision they make is prefaced by, is this a good decision for the planet? Is this, in the, in the words of, of the amazing um, Cressy um, from Elvis and Cressy, is this going to make the world better for other people's kids? You know, you, that level of decision making when it's built into the DNA. The other route are those who it is something which they haven't been doing from day one. It's something they're building in later. Both approaches are totally valid. Um, it's a case, and across both of them really, whether you've built it into every decision from the beginning or you're trying to kind of retrofit sustainability, it's about looking at what you can do and what you can do that will make the biggest impact for the least negative impact on your business and yourself. So a lot of businesses are starting by working on packaging because fundamentally that's what customers care about. It's one of the most visible ways in which you can make a change. So it's kind of a good news story for your customers, which is a great thing to be able to do. It's also an area where there is a huge amount of support and information out there to help you make those changes. So I think we're looking at those quick wins, you know, changing the light bulbs in the head office and the warehouse into LED, changing the heating system in the LED to, to infrared and localized heating rather than trying to heat the whole space is strangely enough a good idea. And the, the interesting thing about a lot of these is that frequently they actually lower the costs for your business rather than actually increasing it because the, the industry to help you become more sustainable is doing such great things at the moment and when it comes to our content that we put on our website and our websites if we can put that on more sustainable hosting providers if we can reduce the size of the image and all those things that you do to speed up your website for seo purpose purposes and for usability purposes all of that reduces the carbon footprint of your website so there are so many easy to change things we can do 
that we there are investments in our business that are investments in our planet but which aren't deviations from the roots of, of creating a more successful e-commerce business there, there's so much you can do and i wonder if some businesses are reticent to try some of these changes because they are afraid it will increase their costs especially now with the economy being uncertain but really you know a lot of these changes it's out of necessity and it, it is becoming more of a blueprint in these days which is heartening to see um the un published a report at the end of last year with a, a template for businesses to achieve true sustainability so Definitely check that out and we can share that on some of our channels. What are some interesting case studies you've seen of e-commerce brands really walking the walk when it comes to sustainability? Our big commerce merchant, Eco & Close, is top of mind for me. Uh, they enable their business customers to use sustainable packaging, which is really important, as you mentioned. Yeah, I, I love what Eco & Close are doing. They are um, a brand, I think, are especially because they're kind of on the B2B side of things. I love, I love what they're up to. I find... I try and avoid naming brands necessarily in this because I end up speaking to so many, their stories start to weave into one. So I guess the some of the cleverest case studies I've seen have been around the use of renewable energy. Um, there's a few brands who have big old warehouses who have managed to get amazing funding deals in place to put solar panels across those warehouses that covers most of their energy costs and which they don't have to pay for the installation super clever um, opportunity, a pure cost reduction, but doing great things for the planet at the same time. I think um, the other case studies that get me the most excited are those brands who are trying to do more than just be sustainable themselves. They're trying to create what's coming to be known as your carbon shadow, just when you needed another buzzword in sustainability. But your carbon shadow is the impact you have on everyone else by changing the way you do things and by encouraging them to do things differently. So we think back, you know, uh, maybe 10 years, how many little plastic disposable water bottles we all got through. And now we're all carrying around these plastic bottles. The carbon impact of the people who started suggesting we, we use plastic water bottles is massive compared to the carbon shadow is massive compared to the individual company's carbon impact. So I think those who are, you know, and in practical terms, what that means is you're creating products which are habit changers, like the water bottle has been, like reusable plastic bags have been, like shampoo bars or um, uh, other cleaning products that come without the water in them. So there's less impact on the planet through the delivery processes. If we're also looking at how you're communicating with your customers to get them to change their behaviors. And those ones, because of the impact of that carbon shadow and how it starts to change the industry and consumers' behavior, those are the ones that get me the most excited. Because I think I think at the moment, one of the biggest impacts we can have as an industry is in helping consumers work out how to do better because it's such a confusing space. You mentioned that, you know, how to achieve true sustainability. I would argue, I you know, and I, I respect everything the UN put out and it's a brilliant report, but I would argue no one knows what true sustainability looks like yet. It's, there is no perfect answer. There's a huge amount of gray space. And so we have, a, we have a role to encourage and train and educate consumers to make better decisions and make it less difficult for them to do so. So yeah, my favorite case study is anyone who is going for that carbon shadow impact, not just what's happening in their business themselves. I love that concept and that's new to me today because that really speaks to the influence we as individuals and also as corporations and businesses have. And, you know, speaking of that influence, right, like consumers' attitudes towards sustainability honestly can be really confusing for retailers. Um, you know, I think as a whole, people care more about sustainability than ever. But in practice, the majority of people aren't yet making purchase decisions based on how sustainable the products are or business practices are, right? Um, in 2021, we did a survey and found very few people were willing to spend more on products that were produced or distributed sustainably that in inevitably cost more. Um, and one example that comes to mind, Gen Z is a group highly values climate action. They're known to be really passionate in that space, yet their favorite apparel brand is Shein. So maybe they don't have the consumer spending power yet to make those decisions yet. But I, I wonder, what's your take on consumer behavior today 
how they impact brands' abilities to be more sustainable, and how those we have behaviors or attitudes may evolve in the near future. Well, Leo, I was going to say, I love the fact you brought out the Gen Z, Xi'an, like, what? What's going on there? Um, but I don't think I can say I love that scenario. I think it, you know, it is, they, they're the Gen Z fuel fast fashion, but yet they're the ones who, who campaign the most against climate change. And I think it's, it, it just kind of speaks to the, to the weirdness of the human being, I suppose, you know, how we make these these strange decisions. You know, I've seen stats, you know, that people want to do better, but the difference between wanting to and actually delivering on that is, is bigger than any shift between desire and actual habit that I've seen in the consumer landscape. And I think, I think yes, it is partly about cost because fundamentally it means buying items that are going to last for longer and using them for longer and committing to using them for longer. I think it's also down to that confusion element I mentioned earlier about how, you know, if you think, if you th- we think simply of clothing, you know, is, I was having a, a friendly debate about this on LinkedIn not too long ago. Should I buy the t-shirt that's been made from recycled plastic bottles? Well, yes, but that's still made of plastic. It, if it, it can't be recycled again. It's going to end up in landfill sooner or later. So is that a good decision or not? And then you're kind of, well, but the cotton item has had a load of water used in its production and flew around the world a couple of times and doesn't use a waste material. It uses a, you know, a virgin material. So is that a good decision or should I be using the recycled one? Now, if you then you have to bring into things like number of times you wear it. So if the if the um, if the t-shirt made of plastic water bottles, if you keep that going for ten years in your wardrobe, and then you give it to someone else who keeps wearing it for another ten years, then probably it's okay. I haven't done the maths. Don't quote me on this, anybody. Um, I'm going with the theory here rather than the precise numbers. But it, but it's still you know you kind of get to the point where like, well the ultimate thing was not to create the water bottle in the first place. But way before that, the consumer's head has exploded. And what they've done is they've gone and they've bought the T-shirt they'd normally buy, whether it's a good decision or not. They've just gone, I don't know. I know this one fits me. I'm going to buy that. So we have a huge role in helping the consumer understand, helping them make these habit changes, but also in in trying to influence wider society to make these habit changes more, more of a sticking point uh, or more of a normality. You know, so we start to see in, you know, in, in culture, in every, all the channels we look at, people making these same changes and it becoming normalized rather than it becoming this bye, bye, bye scenario. This idea of influence is, again, really fascinating to me because there's this new term I'm curious if you've heard of de influencing. So this started because Gen Z was kind of having, starting to have some pushback against social media influencers influencers who are really known to kind of push products on people. It's all about buy, buy, buy. Like that's kind of how the the influencer market has evolved. And this idea of de-influencing comes with people paying attention to the impact of buying all these trending products and not really paying attention to the sustainability, you know, side of it. And then on the flip side, we see some influencers kind of co-opting that de-influencing word to kind of add to their own personal brands and not even speaking to the sustainability side of things at all. How important are those like marketing messages and just information consumers get bombarded with every day on social media or wherever um, to really help them be informed, educated consumers? I think it's massive. Um, I I come back to the it's kind of almost easier to understand it in the travel space somehow than it is easier to understand it in the e-commerce space. So um, obviously taking flights is not the best thing you can do for the planet. Uh, Wherever you can avoid them, you should avoid them. There is a charity here in the UK called Flight Free UK who are encouraging people to take a pledge to stop um, taking flights. Right, and then they encourage you to shout about the fact you're not taking flights anymore, or that you're only going to take flights that are long, you know, for journeys that are more than four hours or whatever it may be. You know, it's not it's not a fully black and white scenario. So they're trying to leverage influencer activity to get people to change their behaviour, and hoping the more times people see this, because there was 
there's a studies done that if one person in your friendship group goes, I'm not flying ever again, within 12 months, 30, I think it's 30% of that friendship group will also have gone, yeah, I've massively reduced my flights, if not stopped altogether. So there is this seeing someone else doing it, causing us to change behavior. The other reason I might, I mentioned the Flight Free UK um, a charity is that as well as encouraging individuals to do this and change their behavior in order to encourage others to change their behavior just through the example of it, is they're also currently running a petition to encourage the or to demand that the BBC stops offering flights as prizes in game shows and the end of TV shows and all the rest of it. And it, it, that would have such an impact if people aren't seeing, oh, wow, the amazing prize at the end of this show is that I get a flight and a trip to Spain or something, but I get a train journey or I get a trip to London or I get something that's less carbon intensive. So I, it's a very roundabout way of answering your question, Leah, but I think that constantly seeing this type of impact people doing the right thing is going to have a huge change it's to give another example it's why the fact that here in the uk our love island franchise is now sponsored by ebay and for the last two seasons all the contestants have worn secondhand clothes throughout the campaign that is a huge behavior change driver um so yeah it's education examples shouting about what you're doing in a positive friendly way not like the big stick you must buy secondhand clothes um you can't buy anything that's made of plastic anymore whatever you know not saying that but going look i did something different i'm wearing secondhand i'm not wearing first hand or i bought from this sustainable brand who have made a product that i'm going to wear for the next 20 years all those kind of elements are, are accelerating, I think, the, the process of changing consumer behavior towards a more sustainable behavior set. And by the way, I love Love Island. And who would think that this chaotic dating show would be a great model for small changes you can make for good influence on sustainability. So I love that. Um, you mentioned, you know, a few minutes ago, kind of doing the math about how often an item was worn and trying to kind of see the essentially like the ROI on sustainability of that piece. A few years ago at a, a tech conference, I think it was Shop Talk, I saw some technology that was almost like an RFID tracker that goes on every single product that you can scan and then see the full like footprint of that item. Like how was it made? You know, how many times has it been worn? Like what's the kind of the return right on, on that investment of a more sustainable piece? Is there any technology that you're excited about or familiar with that helps with, you know, making some of these products more sustainable? Yeah, I'm not sure about the usage factor. That's not one I've come across in a way that I've really seen work well. But I think the the, the transparency of the process to when that product got to you, you know, where it traveled, what it did, what it's been made of, what the impact of that was. That is something which there's a few people um, trying to create almost like a traffic light system so you can get to grips with it across different elements of sustainability. Uh, the best one I've seen is a company called Dayrise who have put uh, kind of an algorithmic method of getting individual products vetted and given a scorecard, which um, doesn't, which costs considerably less than hiring a consultant to do it for you. And But I think it's, there's, there's many others than just Dayrise doing it. And it's going to be very interesting to see who kind of wins and who becomes the gold standard for the, these assessments. Um, I guess a, a key point, which I haven't mentioned yet, but which I should mention, is that sooner or later, the government is going to force us to track these things. You know, they, it's it, either the government's going to force people who you sell via to know the answers, so then you're going to have to do them, or they're going to reach the point where they, they're forcing you to be able to display this alongside your products. So I think, um, you know, there's the tools are out there now. So to start tracking it, understanding it and working out how to improve it, you will be ahead of the curve and it will be less of a scram frantic scramble when the legislation reaches, reaches you because sooner or later the legislation is going to reach all of us. I can easily see that coming into fruition because I remember a few years ago, restaurants started being required to put like calorie counts on the sides of things um, and, you know, label warnings like you know 
no marketing companies or you know commercials are heavily advertising you know cigarettes or vapes anymore so i hope we see that level of regulation with marketing for sustainable products soon we're almost out of time so i wanted to ask you chloe what do you think the future holds for brands that commit to sustainability i think we can agree the positives greatly outweigh any negatives but are there any obstacles you can foresee i think in you know if you want your e-commerce brand to succeed over the next 5 10 20 years sustainability has to be part of your strategy part of your plan because fundamentally um and this is where the obstacles come in we are coming to a point in time where you have to ask yourself the question should my business exist is the product i produce a good use of the earth's resources should i be encouraging people to buy that and it's a pretty scary question to ask um in most cases it's a hard one to answer you know i've worked for a couple of brands where you know, in the past where it's like, yeah, this clearly does not need to exist. This is clearly a bad use of the earth's resources. But I think, um, you know, for most brands, you know, in some brands it's like, yes, we're doing good things. It's great. We should continue to exist. But there's a big old gray area in the middle. And I don't entirely know how we answer that for most brands yet, but that's going to be the biggest obstacle. I think we're going to see brands no longer existing if they aren't able to follow these steps towards becoming more sustainable and taking their customers along with them. There is some big changes ahead in the next three, five years. Well, I certainly hope so. And I, I would love to see sustainability considerations be part of like the product market fit process. Like, right, not only is there a need, but is there a positive impact this product or business model is going to make? So I love that. Um, Chloe, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you again for being here. Can you tell our listeners how they can find your podcast or get in touch with you? Sure. So the podcast is called E-Commerce Master Plan. You can find it on all the usual podcast platforms. And if you want to get in touch with me, the easiest place to do that is LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, so just get in contact there and you can find everything I'm up to at ecommercemasterplan.com. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Thank you so much, Chloe. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us. That's it for today's episode. You can catch Big Commerce on Chloe's podcast as well. Search for the episode of e-commerce master plan with our very own senior vice president of product marketing, Megan Stabler. It's a great one. And if you'd like to learn more about what you can do to take action against climate change, go to earthday.org and go to their act on climate change page. A big thank you to our listeners for tuning in to the Make a Big podcast. We'll see you next time.